God is not a concept. God is a way of life. I'm, 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 I'm coming for you right now. <laughs> I got to. I said, I was supposed to go upstairs. I've been down here in the studio, but I said, you know what? I'm not going to go to sleep with this word in me because there's somebody else that can have an appreciation for what I just shared. It's not a concept. It's a way of life. You either believe or you don't. And you have a choice to frame those tears that you're now experiencing with gratitude and hope and expect expectation that God is still in charge. This is no place for a warrior. This is a place for a warrior. Mm. He's checking me, the motivator. And he had me to look at my tears differently. And I'm saying to you, there's something in you. He kept saying that to me. He said, you, when I was going through some tough times, you brought something out of me. I would listen to you when I'm in a dark place and going through some tough experiences. And he began to cry. And I cried with his tears of tears of gratitude and appreciativeness that I was able to touch him in spite of what he was going through and is going through with muscular dystrophy, but he has not allowed that to control his life. He said to me, the motivator, God is not a concept. It's a way of life. And whatever area of your life that requires some attention, whatever you are dealing with, whatever the pain, the tragedy, the stuff that, that, that life catch you on the blind side that you didn't see coming. It's a way of life. So you prove the stars are here and the stars are there. Well, whatever, can you get there? Does it matter? I just enjoy looking at them. They're beautiful. It doesn't affect me. None of that affects my path through this realm. Whatever the shape is, wherever it's located, the main thing that affects me on my path through this realm is the emotional state that I'm in the energetic state that I convey. And the most definite part of this whole journey, the only part of it that is absolutely unavoidable is exiting the realm. Eventually I'm gonna die. We're taught to live our lives in fear of that and to do everything we can to avoid that. But it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen to everybody at some stage. There's no avoiding it, it's just the way it is. You're gonna leave this realm you're going to leave it. You're going to die one day. The question is, how do you want to spend your time in the realm and how do you want to exit the realm? Are you prepared to allow yourself to be pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and cowed and cowed, and walk around being afraid to talk to anybody and have no life here at all because you're scared of the one part of life which is inevitable, which is going to happen to you anyway? Or would you prefer to just exit the realm now before they do that? You know, and I'm not saying commit suicide or anything like that, but I'm just saying stand in your power and allow whatever happens to happen. Because if everybody did that, we wouldn't have to do any of this. You could turn off your television, shut down your smartphone, turn off the internet, the whole would go away. How many people are prepared to do that? And how many people are prepared to allow themselves to be pushed and squashed and squashed and squashed in order to avoid death when death is the one part of life which is inevitable? I could have easily faded down the sideline, running with my guy as the quarterback was dropping back to release the ball. But as I'm running and checking my guy, I see my teammate getting beat. My guy who I told in the tunnel, hey man, if you get beat, I got your back. And I knew my teammate probably would have caught the guy if he would have caught the ball. Because my teammate, he went on to be a first round, 10 pick, multi-million dollar guy, went on to play for the Patriots. So I knew he was a pretty talented guy and he probably would have caught the guy and tackled him. But I told him, hey man, if you get beat, I got your back. And it just so happened, a play unfolded with a little bit over two minutes left in the game to where my guy, now he was getting beat. And I'm fading off on my guy, but I see the quarterback, he was releasing the ball to the guy that was beating my teammate. And I said, man, I gotta go, I gotta have his back. And I go up and I roll up and I go to hit this guy to end the game. This tackle probably would have ended the game if I'd have hit him and caught him the right way. If I'd have hit him and caught him how I really wanted to catch him, 
it probably would have ended the game and I would have made him fumble because I knew the game of football like you guys know the furniture business. I knew it in and out. Like a guy take two steps off the line of scrimmage, I could tell you which way he was going. A guy would cut inside, I could tell you it's only about three things he can do out of this formation. Like I knew it in and out. And so I knew if I'd have caught him in the right location at the right time, I'd have popped that ball out. But it didn't work like that. I hit him and as soon as I hit him, it seemed as if every breath in my body left. I lost control of my body. Never happened to me before. Body went completely limp. Seemed as if every breath in my body left. I'm, I'm falling to the ground. Like, man, what's happening? And I black out. As soon as I hit the ground, I black out. Never happened to me before. And I black out. I come back to. My teammates run over to me. Hey, Ink, get up, man. Let's rock. Let's go. So I can't. So what do you mean you can't? You always get up. Get up. Let's roll. So I can't move. So there's a shock going from my neck to my toe. I can't feel anything. Shock eventually left and it stayed in my right arm and hand. I remember as I was lying there, they were bringing the spine board out. They put me up on the spine board and as they're willing me off the field, I looked up to the sky and said, surely nothing has happened in this moment that can alter my life. This is what I love to do. They get me over to the ambulance. They said, man, we're going to take you to the hospital. Run some CAT scans. We'll bring you back into your room. We'll tell you what's up. I said, all right, cool. They take me in the room. They run CAT scans. They bring me back into another room. And when they put me into the room in my hospital bed, my mother comes in, she kisses me, she prays for me, and as she's going to walk out, doctors rush in from the opposite side as my mother is walking out. And when my mother told me, son, you'll be all right, there was a certain element of peace attached to it. Because I had been with my mother my whole life. Me and my father, our relationship was pretty much a business relationship. Early years, he wasn't there. When I started playing sports, he came along in the picture, but I needed him to get out of my situation. Right? And so we had a business relationship. But when my mother said something to me, I had been rocking with my mother since I was 16. I had Miss Mills with my mother since I was since she was 16, I mean. And so when she said it would be okay, I was like, all right, cool. And as she's going to walk out, doctors running in and say, hey guys, get in here. We gotta rush him back to surgery. He's about to die. This is a new ball kid. Like I was a part of the football game, but this, this is a new game. I said, die. I said, yeah, man, you busted up your clavian artery in your chest. You're bleeding internally. Got to rush you back, take that main vein out of your left leg, plug it into your chest in order to save your life. You don't have much time. Next morning, I wake up from recovery. He said, Inky, I got some good news and some bad news. Good news, we saved your life. I said, thank you. Bad news is you got nerve damage in your right shoulder. I said, all right, cool. He said, we got to send you up to the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. I said, all right, cool. He said, but the problem is, you know that dream of going to the NFL? I said, yes, sir. I'm close. So that's a strong possibility you probably could never play the game of football another day in your life. I said, no way. I said, um, I don't, I don't know if you know how hard I work for this. Like, I don't know if you know, I've been working since I was seven years old. Like, I didn't start out playing football saying, man, I just want to go to the NFL to make it. Yeah, I want to go to the NFL to take care of my family, give back to my community. But the way in which I started playing a game, I started playing in the street and I would be bloody. My mother didn't even sign me up to play. The first white guy I ever met in my life signed me up to play football. A guy riding down the street in a blue pickup truck. Never forget it. My God, love him to death. Pulling down the street in a blue pickup truck, pulls on the curb, steps out of his truck, walks up in the middle of our game. I'm standing there bloody, tackling football in the street. Guy walks up, Trey Hurst, never forget it. My uncle's on the corner, they're drug dealers. In prison right now. They take off running. My uncle Bobo serving 40 years in the federal penitentiary. He looks back, he said, Inky, don't talk to him. He thinking the guy's the cop. Coach Trey, nicest guy in the world. Walks up, he said, man, would you kids like to play football on grass? I said, man, I would love that. He said, he said go in the house and get one of your guardians. I ran in the house, my uncle JJ had married into the family. I said, hey, Unc, man, it's a guy outside. Will you please come and talk to him? Uncle said, sure. Uncle comes outside, Coach Trey said, listen. He said, I don't even supposed to be over. So I brought a kid home. His mom asked me, could I bring him home? I brought him home. He said, I rode down the street. I see these kids playing football in the street. They're bloody. He said, you could bring him across town. I got a lead. Y'all can sign him up. I think it'd be a great opportunity for him. My uncle said, sir, we greatly appreciate it. I hate to tell you, we don't have the money. And I'm standing in front of him because I really want to play. He said, I hate to tell you, but his mother said, she definitely doesn't have the money. She's at work at Wendy's right now. I never forget that coach looked at my uncle. He said, I tell you what. He said, y'all bring him to the park. He said, his address. He said, not only will I sign that kid up, I'll sign every kid in the street up. 
They brought us to the park the next day. He signed every last one of us up and it changed the trajectory of my life. You know, the second person I saw in the hospital after they saved my life, that coach that signed me up to play ball when I was seven years old, crying on my mother's shoulder. You know, the person my mother called on Christmas when me and my family got robbed, they put a nine millimeter and a 45 in my face when I was 15 years old. That coach that signed me up to play ball when I was seven years old. And so what I was telling the doctor was, doc, I got to give some people a return on their investment. Like this can't stop right now. Now I'll never forget, I said to him, I said I never cheated. He said I never cheated. I was taught you work for something, the result will be what you want it to be. Like I never cheated. Like nobody had to worry about me cutting corners. Like a coach could give me a workout, I'll go do it. If my teammate try to cheat, sometimes I'll complete my guy's workout. Like I never, I never, I never believed in it, right? Because I knew every time I cheated, it was a possibility and an opportunity for me to become weaker. And so I never believed in cheating. I never believed in the mentality behind cutting corners and not facing a challenge. Because I understood if it didn't challenge me, it wouldn't change me. I said, man, send me up to the Mayo. My, my career can't be over. I work too hard. And I go up in the Mayo Clinic and I'll never forget. I walk in the room and there's three doctors. And they come in and they say, hey, Inc., here's the deal. We're going to cut to the chase. They said, uh, you have torn all the nerves and you break your plexus. So what's that? They said, it's the nerve roots that go from your spine. It controls your shoulder, your arm, and your hand. So it goes into your spine like this. You rip them all out. They can't go back in. They said, we hate to tell you, but football career, it's out of you. They said, your shoulder, your arm, your hand, never be the same again. They said, here are your surgery options, Inc. We can take a muscle. Back of your left leg, plug it into your right arm, possibility, weak left leg, weak right arm. The rest. We could take a nerve out of your left arm, reroute it up to your chest, down into your right arm, possibility, two weak arms the rest of your life. We could take a nerve out of your left rib, reroute it up to your chest, down into your right arm, possibility, breathing problem, weak right arm the rest of your life. By the way, tell us what you want to do at 8 o'clock in the morning. Next morning, I walked into the office. They said, what option did you choose? I said, no disrespect to you. Cut me where you got to cut me. I guarantee you, if I don't die, I'll be fine. They said, you got to choose an option. I said, no disrespect to you. Cut me where you got to cut me. I guarantee you, if I don't die, I'll be fine. And what I was telling them was, Doc, you got to take my life before you take my drive, man. I'm not a light switch person. Like, I don't turn it on and turn it. Like, I could play you in checkers. I'm going to try to destroy you. Like, I could play you in a game of, you know, little pitch and hold, a little thing. I'm going to try to destroy you. That's just my mentality of just going all in and everything that I do and what I was telling him, you can cut me wherever you got to cut me. If you don't kill me, you will not stop me because I know my mentality and I know the way I'm wired. I don't turn it on and turn it off. But as life would have it, they cut me six times down my left eye. One time across the left side of my neck, one time across the right side, twice to my right ribs, cut out my right pec, bottom of my armpit, bottom of my hand, 350 staples in my body, bandaged me from my neck to my knee. And they come in my room the next day. They said, Inky, we're going to get to know each other really well. You've been in this hospital the next 40 or 60 days. On the third day, we were leaving the hospital. And as we're leaving and the doors were opening, he said, you broke a record. How did you do it? He said, nobody has ever gotten out of here in under less than 40 days with a surgery of that magnitude. I said, uh, Doc, I just didn't feel as if I had to write. He said, what are you talking about? I had to write. I said, um, I just didn't feel as if I had to write to stop. Like, I, I just didn't feel as if I had to write not to show up and give everything up. Like, I just didn't feel as if I had to write to not press forward. Like, I just felt as if the people that I represent and the people that had invested in me and built the, the, the gentleman that you see called Inky, it's a lot of people that go into the, like, when they were out there telling me, man, I admire what you've been through. I admire the place you've gotten to in life. And I told them, I said, there was a lot of people that helped me. And I take those spirits with me every day, like, uh, Maya Angelou has a quote that says, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. 40,000 or so specialized cells configured in a way that creates a neural network in the heart. It's their brain-like cells, but they're not in the brain, they're in the heart. And it's actually called the little brain in the heart. What they found, what the scientists discovered, is that these cells think independently of the cranial brain. They feel and they remember. And what that means is every experience that we have, even this one right now, I'm registering this experience in two places. This is a good experience, so it's not a problem. I'm registering in my cranial mind as well as in my heart. But if we were having a trauma, it would still be registered in both places. And if I tried to heal that trauma only through thinking about it or talking from my mind, it might feel incomplete. The healing may feel incomplete. And the reason is because I've only addressed 
what happened in here. I haven't addressed what happened in here. And we know this intuitively. I did an experiment a few years ago. Every culture I went to in every age group, I asked little kids, I said, where are you sitting right now? Show me where you're sitting. And people say, I'm sitting right here. They say, right here. Or you ask the indigenous people, you know, where do you live? Well, this, this is my home. And almost instinctively, we know that the heart is, is the seat of our existence, is the seat of our being. You don't see them hitting their head, you know, or their arm or, or something else. So when we talk about heart intelligence, what we're talking about is the ability for these neurons to us to communicate with the neurons in a way that is meaningful to those neurons. These neurons are linked to a wisdom, to an intelligence that is right for us. Mine is right for me, yours is right for you. And any question that you ask this intelligence, uh, it will answer you in a way that will serve you in, in that moment. It will never tell you to do anything dangerous or anything that would hurt in, anyone else. I'll give you a, a perfect example. I was in Australia over 9-11. Couldn't get back into my own country. Uh, until the flights were flying again. And when they did fly, uh, I was in Sydney, Australia, and there was a Boeing 747, that's a big plane, with fewer than 20 people that were gonna come to, to the US. And there was, uh, at the ticket counter, uh, we were at the gate to board, and the agent said, there's so few people, we're not gonna board by boarding rows. You, you can board this plane if you want to, and go, go to America. And I said, well, you don't sound very encouraging. She says, I don't know what happened in that country, she says, but this plane's gonna go there if you wanna go there. I don't know if it's gonna happen again. I don't know if it's over, but if you wanna get on the plane, you know, get on the plane. And really didn't instill a lot of confidence in me or the other people that were there. I said, hold that thought, just wait a minute. And I stepped around the corner and there's a technique where you can literally, you touch your heart like this. And when you touch your heart, your awareness will always go to the place where you feel the touch. Success, guys, a very, very lonely road, man. And along that road, you're not going to see too many friends. You're going to see your shadow most often. See, the thing is, for many people, they've tried the same path you're on, and they failed. As you walk this journey, you're going to see carcasses all over the place of people that didn't quite have it. How do you know you're on the right path? Where do you go to ensure that? If today you never say good enough, tomorrow you'll always have enough. It's not the title that makes you. It's not the success that makes you. The character defines the success, defines the fame, and it starts right there. Championships aren't won in the theater of the arena. They're won in the thousands of hours in the training room, in the labs, in the 5 a.m. runs, when it's raining, when everyone else is sleeping. That's when it's won. It's how you look at something. If your name's attached to it, that you do it right, the best of your ability every single time. The heart of a champion is a light switch that's always on. It doesn't go on and off if someone's watching. It's constant. How you hold yourself in the small things of life build the character winning blocks of the things that we remember for. Isn't it funny how you can find yourself in a state that you're really not supposed to be in? Maybe you're not in a physical cemetery, but you're in a spiritual cemetery. You're just in a dead place. Let me talk to you a minute because I know you all have never been in a dead place. <laughs> but I know what it is to be in a dead place. I know what it is to get up and get dressed and put on my clothes and drive to work and nobody know that I'm living in a dead place. I know what it is to paint a smile on my face just because I know you're looking at me and you expect me to smile and keep to myself the secret that right now I am living in a dead place. When you find yourself living in a dead place, you are so excommunicated from everybody around you that it's hard for people to reach you when you're living in a dead place. See, I say if you look at your life, and if you're not getting what you want, you owe it to yourself to do something differently. 85%, they say, of Americans go to jobs that they're unhappy. If you're doing something eight hours a day that you don't like, it's not giving you what you want, it's not giving you a strong feeling of satisfaction and fulfillment. If that's what it is, you owe it to yourself to start strategically working to change directions. Most people will resist change. Most people will fight change 
as if change would be worse than what they're experiencing. I'm wondering if there's any brothers in here who have broken restraints, gone over the limit. People told you this is as far as you're supposed to go, but you find yourself going beyond the limit. People who love you try to tell you you're going too far, but you won't listen because you're a grown man. You can do what you want to do whenever you want to do it and go wherever you want to go. Have you ever seen independence get somebody in trouble? Too much freedom can be a dangerous thing. It's a good thing to have some discipline in your life, to set some boundaries and say, I don't go past this point. Taking responsibility for whatever happens to you, knowing that you have consciously made the decisions that are now affecting you, knowing that what is happening now today is the direct result of your activity, what you did yesterday. Self-reliance is basically counting on yourself. Now, being self-reliant doesn't mean you can't work with others or trust others. Self-reliance means counting on yourself, trusting yourself, being confident with yourself, being responsible to yourself, trusting your own instincts. We all have people that come against us make negative comments. Human nature is to get in there and try to straighten them out, prove to them how they're wrong. We think we have to defend ourselves. After all, that's our reputation. But the problem with this approach is as soon as you get one person straightened out, three more will pop up. There will always be somebody that's against you. Somebody that's trying to make you look bad. If you're constantly trying to defend yourself, you'll get distracted fighting battles that you were never supposed to fight. It's easy to get baited into conflict, thinking, did you see what they said about me on social media? I'm gonna show them who they're messing with. Do you know how much energy it takes to try to pay somebody back? You are spending emotional energy that you need for your dreams, for your goals. Here's the key, quit worrying about the chatter, the negative comments, those are all distractions. That's the enemy trying to bait you off course so you'll waste your time and energy involved in battles that don't matter. Success, many will love you for it. The majority will hate you. Because your success makes them feel insufficient in their current endeavor. Reminds them of where they could have done it but they came up short and how they didn't revisit it. The difference between a winner and a loser, the failure's there for some time. This is the winner gets back up, does it again, and does it again, until it goes his way. So now you're down that path and you're all alone. How do you know you're on the right path? How do you know what you're doing is in the right direction? Look at the small things of life. How do you do that? If you decide to take the initiative to change the current quality of your life, I say to you that you will find that the universe is on your side, that life is on your side. Now, would it be easy? No, no. Will you have some opposition? Yes. See, a lot of people won't try anything different in life because they don't want to get hurt. Let me tell you something. It's too much pain to duck. Pain is everywhere. Victor Frankl calls it unavoidable suffering. You can't duck it. But most people spend their life not wanting to deal with the pain of rejection, the pain of being disappointed, the pain of losing, the pain of failure, the pain of not being right, the pain, the pain, the pain. That's called life. Life is full of pain. It's everywhere. But guess what? There's no gain without pain. Gestalt psychologists give an example of being self-reliant. They say that you're responsible for getting caught in the rain. They say that by deciding not to carry an umbrella every day, you have made the decision to endure an occasional drenching. Translation, by not being prepared, you make the choice of getting caught in some of life's unpleasant circumstances. Be they rain, failures, economic losses, relationship losses, professional losses, personal losses. By not being prepared, thinking ahead, 
It's your choice. Now here's the other side of it. By being prepared, you increase your chances of success. You increase the likelihood. By being prepared, you increase your chances of success, of seizing opportunities when they come your way, of being ready within yourself to take advantage of once in a lifetime situations. Some people tend to blame others for their mistakes, blame others for their failures. Somebody says, it's not my fault the report isn't done. So-and-so didn't do their part. Of course it's your fault. It's your report too. It's your responsibility to see that everyone you delegated work to does their part. Now you can't control what others around you do, but it's in your own best self-interest your enlightened self-interest, that you stay on top of things, especially if it's going to affect your future. You think your boss cares that John didn't do his part? You think he sees John as the bad guy? Of course not. All he sees is that the report isn't done, bottom line. Be responsible for the things that affect you. You can make sure you're more responsible by checking in with those people who are working with you the people who make up your team. You can be more responsible by saying, hey John, how are you doing with your part? Do you need some help? Can we put somebody else in here to help you finish? Now if John consistently doesn't handle his part, you've got to replace John. If he isn't doing his share, you've got to find somebody that will, or what? It will negatively affect you. You can't wake up in the morning that the project is due hoping and wishing that John has done his part. No, you've got to be responsible because it's going to affect your career too. Now, my approach to my better future very early on in my career was to just go through the day with my fingers crossed. And I used to say something like, I sure hope things will change for the better. Then here's what I found out. They're not going to change. Somebody says, well then, how will my life ever change? Answer, when you change. When you change, when you get better, it'll get better. If you change, it'll all change. Don't put it on someone else. Hope that someone else will change it for you. So many of us, we think that Friday is when life begins. We think Friday, when we stop working, is when we can be happy. Can we turn Monday into the new Friday? You ought to wake up every single day of the week. Doesn't matter if it's Friday. Doesn't matter if it's Saturday. You ought to wake up and say, devil, not today. It's Monday, and I got a vision for my life. When I retire, then I will be happy when I can finally cease working. The only problem is as you start to study research, what you'll discover very, very quickly is that when people retire, do you know that the death rate increases? When people retire, depression increases. What if the thing you despise is keeping you alive? The first reason why people hold back in life is because they keep putting their life on the back burner. They keep waiting till later to start living the life that they were meant to live. Because we all think that we got infinite time. We all think that we've got this enormous amount of time. Well, let me tell you something. If you keep waiting to live your life, eventually it's going to pass you by. Eventually, everything that you wanted to accomplish is going to just pass you by if you never find the confidence or never find the hope or never find the will or the belief that says you should try to do this. I see so many people out there that are like, I have a goal, but I can't do that right now. I want to pursue my dream, but we live in a pandemic. I see a whole bunch of people out there who have a dream, but they're too scared to go after it. It begins right now with no one looking at it. How you hold yourself, how you see yourself. What do you do when no one's watching? If you do it then, I guarantee you, you'll be doing it when everyone's watching. Take responsibility for yourself. Take personal responsibility. You can't change the circumstances or the seasons or the wind, but you can change your reading habits. You can change whether or not you go for the skills, burn the midnight oil, turn yourself around. 
multiply your value by two, three, five, ten. That you've got charge of. That you have control of. You don't have control of the constellations, but you've got control over whether or not you go to night school, take adult classes, learn some new skills. You have control over that. And if you don't, that's your fault. You've got to take personal responsibility. You've got to be self-reliant. You, you, you. Nobody else can change your life, alter your ambitions, pave a golden road for you. But you can. It's up to you. Be responsible for yourself. Learn to reap the harvest without complaint. This is a sign of growing maturity. And here's where it comes from: taking full responsibility. Take full responsibility for everything you do. Be responsible to yourself. It's your crop. Whatever your paycheck is, take full responsibility. You say, "Well, it's my employer." No, it's not your employer. You can become twice as valuable, three times as valuable. Burn the midnight oil. Learn some more skills. Bring more value to the marketplace. I'm telling you, whatever your harvest is, take it without complaint. Take it without blaming others. Self-preparation leads to control over your life. We discussed this in the last session. Whenever you prepare correctly, taking all of the steps you're supposed to take, doing everything in your power to stay on track. Whenever your preparations lead to success, achieving your goals. You reinforce the disciplines that got you there. Success leads to reinforcement of the proper disciplines. If what you're doing is working, keep doing it. If what you're doing isn't working, change it. When you are doing all that you can possibly do and are successful at reaching your expectations, keep doing it. Success is a reinforcement. Psychologists call this positive reinforcement. We all know about positive reinforcement. That's how we train our dogs. That's how we teach our kids. That's how the trainers at Sea World can get a killer whale to do tricks and follow commands, and work side by side with humans by positive reinforcement. When you bring a brand new puppy home and try to teach him not to mess in the house, what do you do? You reward him for going outside or scratching at the door. When you're trying to get your toddler out of the diaper stage, what do you do? You reward her with special presents, make her feel special for learning something new. When you're trying to get your older kids to crack the books and study, what do you do? You reward them when they get good grades. You teach them that the skills they are developing now will have great positive effects on their lives later. But you reward them now. This is positive reinforcement. Learning that there are rewards for doing something good, something worthwhile, something of value. The greater the value, the greater the reward. The better you do, the better your reward. The greater the value, the greater the reward. A bigger paycheck, a better house, financial freedom. It's all a reward system. Now there are two major benefits of positive reinforcement. Number one, positive reinforcement builds good habits. If what you are doing, the habits you've gotten into, are building your ambition and increasing your success, keep doing them. Your success is reaffirming that these habits are good. Your success tells you that you need to keep doing what you are doing. By reviewing these habits that bring on success. You reinforce them, give them sticking power. Now here's the other side. By reviewing your habits, what you do every day, by reviewing your habits, you may find out that some of them are inhibiting your success. You may find out that what you're doing every day is bad for you, or you may realize that you've gotten out of some very good habits. Somebody says, "Well, I've just gotten out of the habit of taking my daily walk around the block." Well, I guess you'll just have to get in the habit of being sick down the road. Somebody says, "Well, I used to read the books all the time. I've just gotten out of the habit." Then change it. Go back into your disciplines. If you've just gotten out of the habit, just get back into the habit. 
It's called discipline. If it doesn't work, don't do it any longer. You can keep your fingers crossed if you want to and hope that it'll all straighten out. You can wish for the wind not to blow quite as severely to change in your favor, but we call that naive at best. If the habits that you've gotten into aren't serving you, change them. You can't keep doing this any longer. Don't wish for a better win. The key is to wish for the wisdom to set a better sail. Utilize whatever wind that blows to take you where you want to go. That is the philosophy I picked up at age 25, and it revolutionized my whole life. And here's what I found. I found it was easy. I became a millionaire when I was 31, and I found it was easy. Now here's my definition of easy. It was something I could do. I figure if it's something you can do, it's easy. But here's a little parenthesis. I worked hard at it. I made sure my disciplines were in line. I made sure my habits were good. I made sure I did all that I could. I found something that I could do, but I worked hard at it. I got up early, stayed up late, and worked hard from age 25 to 31. But what I did was easy, meaning it was something I could do. Well, you say, Mr. Roan, if it was so easy, how come during those six years, all those other people around you didn't get rich? Here's why. It's easy not to. How else would you describe it? That's it. It's easy to keep doing the things that don't work. It's easy to keep bad habits. It's easy not to develop the disciplines. It's easy not to. So how come I got rich and they didn't? Here's a philosophical phrase. The things that are easy to do are also easy not to do. That's the difference between success and failure, between daydreams and ambitions. Here's the key formula for success. A few disciplines practice every day. And those disciplines have to be well thought out. What should you spend your time doing? Don't waste your time on things that aren't going to matter. But a few simple disciplines can change your whole economic future. Future with your family, future with your business, future with your enterprise, your sales career, your management career. A few simple disciplines, a few simple habits, good habits, repeated every day. Now here's the formula for failure. Errors in judgment, repeated every day. All you've got to do is to have a few errors in your judgment and repeat them every day. I'm telling you, they'll spin out of control in 10 years. You'll end up driving what you don't want to drive, wearing what you don't want to wear, living where you don't want to live, earning what you don't want to earn. A few errors every day, bad habits every day, it's disastrous. Now here's why it's easy to repeat an error in judgment. Because failure doesn't fall at the end of the first day. Bad habits don't show their horrible results at the end of the first day, or the first week, or the first month. It's easy to get faked out. If disaster fell on us at the end of the first week, we'd change our philosophy. But it's so subtle. Errors in judgment, bad habits. They're so subtle, they get you a little off course, a little off course, a little off course, you keep drifting off course, and all of a sudden you're caught. So you've got the choice right now of one of two easies, easy to do or easy not to do. I can give you in one sentence how I got rich by the time I was 31. I did not neglect to do the easy things I could do for six years. I did not neglect, that's the key. I found something easy I could do that led to fortune, and I did not neglect to do it. The major reason for not having more of what you want in America, more health, more money, more power, more influence, more everything, the major reason is simple neglect. Neglect. And if you don't take care of neglect, it becomes an infection, and then it becomes a disease. So if you're in the habit of not doing it, 
doing all it takes to get ahead, get in the habit of doing. Doing all it takes. That's the first benefit of positive reinforcement, building good habits. Now, the second benefit of positive reinforcement is that it creates the energy to fuel additional achievement. It gives you the drive to do more, to not only keep on doing what's right, but to do more of what's right. The disciplines that will help you grow and get ahead of it all. The knowledge that what you're doing is paying off creates more energy to keep going. How easy is it to get up in the morning when you know you're not doing all that it takes? It's not very easy at all. You can just lay there awake thinking, oh, what's a few more minutes in bed? It won't matter much anyway. Wrong. It does matter. It will matter. Now, how easy is it to get up in the morning when you're pouring it on, doing the best you can, anxious to get going, make progress toward your dreams? It's a whole different story. When you're resting to renew your reserves, it's much different than resting to avoid your day. When you're psyched up and excited for your life, when you're excited for what you've planned to accomplish for the day, it's amazing. You'll wake up before the alarm clock even tries to startle you away. Your successes fuel your ambition. Your successes give you extra energy. Your successes pave the way for more successes. It's the snowball effect. With one success, you're excited to meet another, and another, and another. And pretty soon, the disciplines that were so difficult in the beginning, the disciplines that got you going, are now part of your philosophy.